Hi everyone, my name is Nicholas Chautala. I'm curator of cultural history at the New Jersey State Museum and co-curator of our newest exhibition, Fine Feathered Friends, Birds as Mainstay and Muse. Welcome to the latest installment in our short video series tied to the exhibit. If you like birds, you know that there are tons of online resources out there. They have pictures, bird calls, migration maps, and fun facts about every species. A number of these sites have recycled this statement as a bird fact for the little blue heron. When I saw this, it surprised me since it seems to contradict a number of historical accounts that I've come across over the years. In this video, I will explore this statement further and in the process, reveal what is an unremembered tragedy of the little blue heron. In the mid 19th century until the early 20th century, people were in love with the beauty of the bird world but not in the way you might think. The feathers of wild birds were a sartorial status statement, adorning fashionable garments and accessories, particularly those worn by women. The biggest feather using industry was millinery or women's hat making. Magazines promoted bird feathers as the pinnacle of fashionable headwear. And it wasn't just the feathers, whole wing segments, or in some instances, entire taxidermy birds also adorned these hats. In 1886, a New Jersey-born ornithologist named Frank Chapman sought to bring attention to the problem. One day he traveled the streets of New York counting birds, but the birds he counted were not flying around Central Park. They were the decorations on women's hats. He counted 700 hats decorated with 40 native bird species. The demand for bird feathers was satisfied by an army of so-called plume hunters, those who killed wild birds for their feathers. Millions of birds were killed worldwide. This magazine illustration from the period places blame on women, going so far as to suggest that the figurative trigger was pulled by female fashionistas, not the plume hunters themselves. The woman in yellow, possibly the esteemed French hat designer Coco Chanel, shows no remorse as dead birds fall by her hand. The French millinery trade, depicted as retriever dogs at her feet, were mere pawns in the process, subservient to their master's whims. But if women were part of the problem, they were also a key part of the ultimate solution. In 1896, two nature-loving women in Boston named Harriet Hemingway and Mina B. Hall co-founded the Massachusetts Audubon Society. Naming their organization after the celebrated bird artist John James Audubon, their key motivation was to discourage the wearing of feathers. New Jersey wasn't far behind. Just one year later, Garden State bird lovers founded the New Jersey Audubon Society with a similar purpose. A Plainfield woman named Mary A. Mellick served as the organization's first secretary. Two of the species most impacted by the plume hunting trade were the great egret and snowy egret, which were often referred to as herons in the 19th century. It's really no surprise that they were targeted for fashion. These birds are absolutely stunning. The great egret is tall and graceful with a long S-curved neck and striking all white feathers. It lives in coastal estuaries and marshlands up and down the coasts and even into the interior. It is often found frozen in a statuesque position, waiting for the right moment to strike its prey with a long spear-like bill. The snowy egret is equally pretty, though smaller. Its name, of course, derives from its immaculate all-white plumage. The snowy egret has large yellow feet and is often seen tramping around in shallow water. This action is thought to stir up the small fish and aquatic animals on which it feeds. At breeding time, these two species of birds develop long, wispy, all-white feathers known as aigrets, from the French for egret. These showy breeding feathers were what the plume hunters were after. Why? Because fashion magazines touted them as the perfect fashion accoutrement. Listen to what one 1894 magazine had to say about them. Quote, the egret's plume is probably the most perfect finish to any form of headdress known, so light and airy that though it springs from earth, it seems that it might rise to heaven. Yet 
Being of mortal growth, it wavers between either, and like the white bird from whose shoulders it springs, soars or sinks with divided love for both. End quote. These lovely white breeding plumes were a death sentence for the great egret and snowy egret. The species faced near extinction at the turn of the 20th century because of the plume hunters. So now let's return to that statement about another bird in the heron egret family, the little blue heron. Well, it's true. The little blue heron doesn't develop those all-white breeding plumes. But were they really saved from the plume hunting frenzy because of their lack of showy egret feathers, as those contemporary bird sites state? A good number of journalistic accounts from the period 1880 until 1910 suggest otherwise. In 1888, this article talked about how plume hunters active on the Gulf Coast of Florida brought about an especial scarcity of the little blue heron. In 1890, an article in The Sun noted how the white herons, as well as blue herons, that 10 years ago were seen most numerously, are now a thing of the past. Most descriptive was this article in the ornithology journal titled The Auk from 1887. In it, the author describes his first person experiences coming upon a bird habitat recently decimated by plume hunters. He states that among the species most impacted by the destruction were the snowy heron, great white egret, and the little blue heron in both phases of plumage. Finally, an account closer to home. In 1908, the New Jersey State Museum annual report contained a study of New Jersey birds. In the preface, the author states, in New Jersey, the women who encouraged this slaughter by wearing bird plumage have been responsible for the extermination of the American egret, snowy heron, little blue heron, and least tern, all of which used to breed regularly along our coast, but today are but the rarest stragglers from the south. So from these accounts, the little blue seems to have suffered great losses in this period. But if they didn't have the showy breeding plumes so sought after by the industry, then what explains this? Well, for an answer, let's turn to this artifact on view in the Fine Feathered Friends exhibit. This little blue heron porcelain sculpture is an extremely rare artist proof by the celebrated Hungary-born artist Laszlo Espanki. It was one of the first pieces Espanki designed for the Cebus Company of Trenton, where he worked as a master designer and ceramist. You'll immediately notice the color. It's a little blue heron, but the sculpture shows the bird as being white. That's not an artist's stylization. It's an astute observation of nature. The young little blue heron is indeed white. It takes a year before they develop their namesake blue feathers. The little blue heron is about the same size as a snowy egret, and a young little blue in its immature white plumage looks very much like a snowy. The two birds were also known to flock and roost together in large multi-species groups. So it seems that the little blue herons, though not the specific target, were also killed during the hunts for the favored snowy egrets, simply because they looked so very similar, especially to plume hunters who had no interest in wasting time telling the difference. But this final newspaper account about a poacher killing birds for their feathers shows a black market value for a little blue heron plume. The value was well below the value of a snowy egret, but the fact that little blue heron feathers did in fact have a market value suggests that they were being hunted for their feathers too. Yet another piece of evidence to suggest that the little blue heron's lack of showy egret plumes did not save them. Today's story, however, doesn't end on a sad note. Thanks to the active efforts of women like Harriet Hemingway and the New Jersey Audubon Society, the crusade to stop the killing of wild birds reached the ears of national politicians. In 1918, the federal government passed the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. This important legislation protected native birds on a nationwide scale and helped those threatened to near extinction by the plume crazy fashion industry to recover and rebound. Birds continue to face a host of other threats. But today, we can therefore enjoy the beauty of the bird world where it belongs. Not on our hats, but in our marshes, our fields, our forests, our beaches, and even our own backyards. 
that's all for this time stay tuned for more short videos about birds tied to the new jersey state museum exhibition fine feathered friends birds as mainstay and muse